I'm very curious, or let's say surprised, about all the topics we're discussing here, because, of course, universities are the place where you learn how to experiment and where experiments are actually conducted. So it is so fascinating to hear all the time how risk-averse as organizations they are and how risk-averse they are in trying out new ways of teaching, remodeling their approaches. Um, but we heard it so many times this morning, it's so necessary to try out things, to run experiments on how to bring um, a digital era into life and really make the tools beneficial for the quality of education. And our next speaker even goes a step further. She does not only want to encourage universities or places of higher education to run experiments, she actually says experiments need their own space. You need to have a physical lab, in a sense, to really make sure you create a space that brings people together and um, that's the breeding ground for your very own experiments when it comes to education. I'm very glad she's with us because she flew in all the way from Russia, actually. Welcome, Dara Melnik. Thank and you. Dara, just to introduce you properly, um, you actually could have flown in either from Moscow or from West Siberia because in both places you're involved um, in two different um, universities. On the one hand, you're head of research group at Skolkovo Education Development Center, which is placed near Moscow. And on the other hand, you're the curator of Master of Arts in Experimental Higher Education at the School of Advanced Studies at the University of Tumen, which is in Western Siberia. And... Um, so glad to have you here, that you join us. Thank you, and thank you for that introduction. You have just made my work a bit easier. My pleasure. In that sense, I'll hand over to you. Last remark on my end. Um, please join us in the chat. I just realized in the previous sessions that you have to open the chat, maybe. Um, so if the chat is not open, just click on that little error on the side of your screen, because I'll engage you in a conversation in the chat as well, and make sure you'll send us some questions to Dara while she presents. So over to you, Dara. Thank you. I would like to first further uh, normalize experimentation. Everybody experiments. You experiment. You might have recently experimented with a new drink, a new morning routine, a new way to organize your notes. Um, you might have tried a new biking route in a way that is experimentation. But today I would like to talk about experimentation in higher education, what it is, why we need it, why it's necessary even, and most importantly, what we currently understand about how to do it. A couple of words, a um, couple of remaining words um, about me. I'm affiliated with a couple of institutions. Um, Skolkov Education Development Center is a think tank. We prepare um, top managers for higher education. Um, that, that's an important part, so bear with me. And uh, School of Advanced Studies within the University of Tumen is actually a university college. So it's an innovative greenfield department within a larger brownfield university, which used to have only undergraduate education, but since recently it also has master's program. Um, one of them, uh, one of those master's programs is experimental higher education, about which I'll be talking about later. So first of all, um, experimentation is relevant for all systems of uh, higher education, but I believe that it's especially crucial for rapidly evolving systems, for systems that uh, might or might not consider themselves peripheral. Russian higher education system is extremely dynamic. It has not always been that, but we um, entered what I like to call the age of change. Uh, you can recognize that in your system, if you have the necessary components, such as windows of opportunity, we have launched multiple state programs which support innovation in higher education over the last decade, which never ceases to uh, amaze me and sounds a bit difficult to believe. Um, for example, this year, uh, Priority 2030, uh, which is an academic excellence initiative a bit similar to excellence strategy in Germany, was launched to support 100 universities on their path to improvement um, internationally um, to serve better uh, internationally and nationally. 
uh, to talk about innovations, you need problems that everybody recognizes, which is also what we've got. While previously our university leaders would gather together to share their achievements, to say we've done this and we've done that, now they tend to talk about problems more. Here's the issue we're having. Let's think how to solve it. How are you solving it? And finally, no change can happen without new leaders. And this is what we have. Um, most of our top institutions have um, leaders that think differently. They're from a different generation. They're not risk averse. Moreover, they actually understand that risk is necessary for sustainability. Um, I enjoy explaining that link using the metaphor of investment portfolios, um, like perhaps Many of you, I started investing a little bit last year as my personal reaction to the pandemic, so I feel like an adult now. Um, strategic portfolios are a bit similar to investment portfolios in the sense that in your university and strategic setup, you might have different stakes and different, um, well, assets. Um, here are three basic strategic portfolios that universities develop. The first one is an absent strategic portfolio when you only really have inertia. Inertia is um, inevitable for higher education institutions because the university is something that's quite old. Uh, we can start um, counting the history of higher education from Plato's Academy. So we are talking um, two and a half thousands of years. So you're bound to repeat some ideas. You're bound to have some inertia. Now, conservative strategic profile or uh, strategic portfolio is when you've got some inertia, obviously, again, and you also use borrowed ideas. So you see trailblazing institutions, leading institutions, trying things out, you think, oh, hmm, I have to have those VR um, fortified um, classrooms. I have to introduce some real projects. I have to make my campus more eco-friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Now, an aggressive strategic portfolio is when you not only have borrowed ideas that work for other institutions, so that's uh, moderately risky, you also develop your own ideas. Um, my little pie chart there is really aggressive. When a quarter of your resources, and by resources I mean financial resources, reputational resources, human resources, I invested into new ideas, you're risking a lot. So a comfortable place to be somewhere between the second and the third um, types of strategic portfolios, you must have new ideas, but you should not stake all that you have on them. Now to truly develop new ideas, you need to experiment. That's where experimentation comes into picture. First of all, um, we should not kid ourselves. Um, universities already experiment because we have no idea what we are doing. We don't know whether pedagogical tools we're using will actually benefit students. We cannot guarantee that we will um, that they will be um, competitive on the labor market. We cannot guarantee that we can teach them how to live. We try different things. They not always work and that is the reality of higher education. So it's high time that we do it consciously, that we actually uh, admit that we experiment, that we are trying things out, that that long history of universities is still uh, not making us sure of what we are doing. Uh, secondly, if you experiment, you can actually gain the lead. If you only borrow ideas, you're always second tier. You're always a student. In a sense, you're always peripheral. You are never the leader. You don't risk, of course, but without risk, you cannot um, gain that advantage. You, you cannot be at the forefront. You cannot dictate what the university is now in the 21st century. And finally, experimentation allows you to come up with unique solutions to unique problems. If you borrow ideas, you borrow solutions to somebody else's problems. It might not apply to um, your situation as well as you like it to. 
And here's um, the problem that um, new university leaders in Russia encountered. So imagine you are a rector and you'd like things to start changing and you'd like things to start changing rapidly because something has to be done and um, you're already comfortable with the idea of risk, but you cannot be everything to all people. You cannot be in all places simultaneously. You need a team of experimenters, of reformers to help you. And the problem is that no one knows how to make reformers. No one knows how to prepare reformers. It's a dish without recipe. So we decided we'd give it a go. We would start um, experimenting with preparing experimenters. And that's how I got to where I am today with the master's program I'll tell you about in a second. We thought, OK, well, uh, we're still talking about professionals, so we need a professional program. And for me, master's programs are the quintessence of professional programs. Um, not PhD programs, not undergraduate education, but master's programs. We started with developing the graduate model. Um, it's quite complex. Actually, what you see on the slide is the heart of it, but we also have those lists of uh, skills and knowledge that our graduates must have because we are obsessed. But um, at the core of the graduate model is our little experimental triangle, which, we, uh, which is how we conceptualize experimental mindset. To us, experimentation consists of a grounded hypothesis you don't experiment to experiment. You actually have a clear idea of how things should turn out. Uh, you should be basing that hypothesis on theory or data, or better yet, on theory and data. Uh, secondly, responsible execution. Unlike experiments in the lab, if something goes south at a university, if students are not happy, if you're actually hurting the institution, you should stop and to consider and develop a different hypothesis. You don't have to make sure it runs its course. And finally, constructive rule breaking. Two words are important here. Obviously, you have to break the rules if you want to experiment. You cannot get new ideas if you only travel to places um, you've been before multiple times. But you also have to understand how universities work. You have to understand the rules, hence constructive rule breaking. It's quite easy to say that we don't need academic disciplines anymore. Let's throw them out of the window. Let's have uh, not interdisciplinary, let's have a disciplinary education and research, but that doesn't work because the nature of knowledge is disciplinary. And that's just one example. You have to really understand the essence of this old and dignified and truly grandiose institution we're dealing with here. And I don't feel uncomfortable saying this to you, uh, unlike that normally happens, um, because you come from universities as well, at least most of you. Um, usually, if I talk to my friends about universities, I just feel weird. But enough about that. Um, this is me. To the left, I had shorter hair then, and to the right is Daniel Kantowski, Associate Director for Education at the School of Advanced Studies, and my creative ally. Our team was and is larger, um, but we didn't take many pictures. We all spent most of the time doing exactly what you see on the pictures, staring at the drawing board. So we got that fancy graduate model, we got that um, experimental triangle that we like very much, and now we had to actually design the program. And that's where um, challenges began. So challenge number one with programs like that, if you want to prepare reformers, if you want to make people who are at the very forefront of innovation, who are the ones basically taking you to the future, you want the best of the best to teach them, right? It just makes sense. But the School of Advanced Studies is at the University of Tumen, and the University of Tumen is in Tumen, and Tumen is in Siberia. And when you think about Siberia, that's what you imagine. And there's not just you, um, that's a lot of people. Uh, we tried many different things. We kindly asked professionals we respected to please consider taking up a position at the University of Tumen. Um, we used our personal networks 
And also we flattered people shamelessly, and yet only the bravest ones would agree to come and join the team um, of the master's program in experimental higher education. But then the pandemic happened, which sort of saved our asses, because while previously we were adamant that the program should be offline, because the, we wanted our experimenters to experiment within the program as well. We wanted master students to experiment on the undergraduate process, which I realize sounds almost scandalous to most universities, but that, that was our idea. So students had to be offline. And in the beginning, we thought that the faculty had to be offline as well, otherwise it just wouldn't fly. Uh, but the pandemic opened our eyes uh, forcefully to other possibilities. We decided that the program would be design driven. It would be graduate model driven, not faculty driven. And each time for each year, we would try to collect um, the roster of faculty that would be serving the current purposes of the program best. Um, this is also Siberia, by the way. That's the campus of School of Advanced Studies, so it's not all in the wild. And this is what we ended up with. The program is based on experiments. Our students experiment with such things as learning effectiveness, evaluation, positioning, including branding, institutional educational policy, um, even institutional mission. One of our students is now designing a new way to develop a mission, a new way that suits innovative institutions. We also have academic courses ranging from things like organizational change to experimental pedagogy. And we have professional development block in which um, our students think how they will be positioning themselves later in the landscape of Russian and international higher education so that they have a clear plan how to apply their new skills as well as possible. The results so far and also the reason why I'm standing here. Um, it's been one year and a couple of months since the launch of the program, but a lot has changed at the School of Advanced Studies. First, it has uh, become a truly reflective institution. If you start thinking how to change things, you um, inevitably focus on how things are. You start um, thinking about the underlying problems. You start digging into possible ways to restructure the process, and it starts changing. Um, new initiatives appear, new ideas appear. We consider things we've never considered before. SAS also, uh, it used to be a benchmark, uh, well, it was the benchmark for Russian higher education in the beginning because um, it's one of the few liberal arts institutions in the country and it's the most international one, but it uh, solidified this role because now it's not just an institution that is unusual, it's an institution that keeps being unusual but in a different way each time, that keeps reconsidering and reimagining itself. And finally, we have entered interinstitutional dialogue, inviting reformers from other universities, discussing their ideas about teaching and learning, um, sharing our ideas, and um, making the very idea of experimentation um, something that's usual to discuss in the country, something that is um, a normal topic for conversation, which was not the case previously. This means that our hypothesis was proven right. We thought that the program would benefit the institution and the system, and it is doing so. And we believe that actually every university and um, in the best case scenario, every system should have um, the place, a specifically designated place where experimentation happens. If we are talking about systems of higher education, there should be institution or institutions that um, are designated to be experimentation sites. If we are talking about universities, there should be the space which is busy with analyzing what's going on, looking, looking problems in, in, in their faces, um, admitting that they are there, thinking how to improve things, um, 
this space or this lab, this model lab, as we like to call it, can also test new models, new approaches, see what works, what doesn't. And in the case if something does work, spread innovations to other institutions. Because higher education advances when we learn from each other. Our universities learned a lot from the Humboldtian model, from German universities in the 19th century. German universities have learned a lot from American universities. And it goes on and on and on. Um, every university is a patchwork of ideas from different places and different people. And it's high time we started doing that in an organized way. Um, it's, it's high time we had specific institutes which are tasked to develop and share innovations. Um, so here's my last message. While my talk was mostly centered on teaching and learning, I think that all processes at universities uh, need experimentation. You have to innovate in the way research is governed, um, in financial models, which became evident last year when a lot of universities got into financial trouble, uh, with services, with technology, something we're discussing today. Um, so dare to experiment, and good luck. Thanks a lot, Dara. Um, let me join you on stage. Um, thanks a lot for the brilliant um, presentation. It looked almost like you've been part of TEDx already. Um, it was so fine-tuned. Thank you. Quite a pleasure. Um, so I do not have questions in the chat. Oh, one just came in. Perfect. Oliver is asking. Um, do you have a concrete example of current innovations which sparkled through the model experimentation lab? Um, let me read it out to you again. Uh, do you have a concrete example of current innovations which um, sparkled through the model ex and then brackets model slash experimentation lab? Hmm. Um, let's see. If we are talking about our experience specifically, um, one of our students um, designed um, an English language exam, which um, wouldn't allow students to cheat and yet didn't use proctoring. So that is an example that we feel confident about sharing. Um, but also, if we look at the experience of other institutions, for example, Maastricht University and AdLab, there are quite a few projects that they have developed and they, that are spread into the larger Maastricht University and beyond. Um, I believe that the, uh, some of the current examples are connected to international higher education, international classroom and global citizenship models and how they um, manifest themselves in the education process. So that would be another example. Wonderful. And now I can actually see that more and more questions come in. So um, looking at um, our audience here, if you do not have the chat tab open yet, you'll find it with that little, little, little arrow on the side of your screen. Um, if you click on that purple arrow, then the chat window opens and you can join us in the discussion here. Um, Martin makes a probably relevant um, comment because you mentioned that you should experiment but not break things, maybe break rules but not um, things or not like um, the, the experience for your students because he says when experiments fail, students are the first to suffer. And also adds a little question mark. Do you see it that way? Did you have one or the other experiment really going wrong where students complained? To where the un because you said like master's experiment with the understudies, so mm -hmm. um, <laughs> where they went on the barricades and said, can we please stop this? Um, there was an experiment that wasn't entirely successful. We were trying to introduce uh, a designated hour of rest for the whole institution, but instead of uh, allowing students to actually rest, they were overwhelmed with various activities like dancing and meditation and relaxing music, which you don't want to hear if you just want to relax in silence and uh, think um, your thoughts in, in privacy and peace. So that went badly, but not tragically so, thankfully. Uh, this is also the fear I always have. Um, the triangle I showed in the beginning had constructive rule breaking. Um, that constructive rule breaking 
uh, in combination with responsible execution is what uh, allows me to sleep at night because I know that students are very, our students are very careful with experimentation. We've read uh, enough uh, books and articles about the 60s and 70s. Y you might recall that the 60s and 70s were the uh, periods of intense experimentation with higher education. And that included co-living, pedagogical models, financial models, campuses. About 200 new institutions appeared worldwide in the 60s and 70s. And some of those things went really badly. Um, some were just closed down and some actually hurt student experience, student educational experience. So responsible execution means that you've got to stop if anything tells you that something is going wrong. You can always go back, think again, start over, that's fine because um, this equilibrium and balance is more important than new ideas in the end. So responsible research, always keeping the actual humans in mind that yes, are part of yes. the research um, that you're conducting. Christiane asks, what's the profile of the participants of the graduate program? The profile. Uh, we target mid-career specialists. Um, we mostly um, attract people who have experience in higher education. Uh, we also have um, a couple of straight uh, straight out of bachelor students, which kind of gives us a nice um, combination, a nice cohort, because people who have been working in higher education um, know more, they are more experienced, but they know more about limitations as well. And people who are straight out of bachelors don't know anything about limitations, so their thinking is a bit more is, is a bit bolder, and if those two groups communicate, good ideas actually um, are born. Coming to that, I think the next question actually fits in perfectly there. Do you have, um, oh, I'm jumping here. Um, are there problems with other institutions having reservations to accepting the degrees awarded in experimental programs? So you create a scenario where you want things to emerge, but is it really accepted on the job market then, for example, or if people want to continue their research at other institutions? Our program was a response. Uh, it was a response to the growing need for experimenters. And that's our local situation. I'm not sure how relevant this is um, worldwide, but I do have a um, suspicion that it is quite relevant. Because for us, uh, we are really in the period of intense transformation. So a lot of people are interested and comfortable with change at the moment, which is unusual, and this will not always be so. Periods of innovation are normally followed by periods of just implementing change and stabilizing things. But now we are in the period of change, and we are riding that wave. Mm -hmm. There's so many more questions that I'll speed up a little bit um, and not slip in my own questions there. And Angelica wants to know, the experimental turn in higher education has an important limit. You're not allowed to experiment with students without permission of the Ethics Commission. How do you deal with this condition? Um, well, firstly, students at the School of Advanced Studies um, are aware that the institution is improving. They don't really see it as experimentation on them because it's not experimentation on them, it's the experimentation on the educational model. So uh, for, they don't see it as a problem as such. Um, as I said, um, all institutions experiment. You try new things. You implement new methods, new formats, new approaches. But in most cases, you just don't call it experimentation. You call it improvement, or you call it optimization, or you call it op modernization. But in fact, you experiment, because you are not sure that is going to work. So for the students, they more feel like they're part of actually remodeling universities and part of a positive change rather than yes. a test yes, subject. Yes, yes, yes. And they also know that their best interests are always held mm -hmm. um, at, at heart. Yes. So they're sure that if they complain, things will go back to the way they were. We have two more questions, so let's make it really quick. Um, do you have a white paper on your experimental process which could be applied or tested at other universities? We have a couple of publications and we're in the process of writing the white paper. 
Okay. So best um, to connect with you probably on LinkedIn um, and stay in touch. Maybe that once that white paper is out, um, you can forward it or send it out. So Katharina, um, just copy paste Dara's name and connect with her on LinkedIn. Um, last question, very quickly. Um, Oliver wants to know why would every university need their own lab, or would a joint approach not be a, an even bigger potential? Um. I think that a cluster is the best approach. If you've got a couple of local labs focusing on local problems, which share their experience and ideas and approaches, that seems like the best way to go. Because otherwise, uh, you could miss on some um, specific, unique issues which, which need to be solving. Wonderful. And that um, brings us to the end of this session. Thanks for this excellent presentation, Dara. Thanks for joining us all the way um, from Russia. And I had to look it up. Actually, really, West Siberia is not underneath Moscow. It's almost the same distance, again, deeper in Russia. So that's quite a journey <laughs> you have to make. Uh,